Well then, without further ado, um, I can start. So I'll, I'll introduce myself um, as I'm the one that you were sort of emailing with. So uh, my name is Madeline. I'm the Director of Communications for Elect Her. Um, I am a fourth year student at UVic. Um, I'm in bio psych. Um, and yeah, so that's me. And then we have another team member with us tonight, which is exciting. Hi. I'm Maya, um, my pronouns are they, she. Um, I'm a first year student and just newly um, in this club as the director at large. Um, I'm very excited and potentially uh, going into the realm of politics, so we'll see. <laughs> um, and yeah, so a little bit about Elect Her. Um, we essentially are a club at UVic um, that hopes to inspire young women and people of marginalized genders uh, to pursue roles in politics. So whether that be elected roles or behind the scenes, um, we just sort of want to provide the confidence and resources uh, for someone who wants to pursue that role to sort of see themselves in it. Um, and we are just going to start with a quick territorial acknowledgement. Um, I'm in Victoria right now. So I'll use the one that uh, is used by the school. So we would like to acknowledge with respect that we live upon the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people's territory and that their vital relationships with the land continue to this day. Um, and so I wanna thank you again, Kate, for, for being here. And if you'd like to do a quick introduction, that would be great. Okay, cool. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. This is clearly a topic in a club that I can definitely get behind. Um, my name is Kate O'Connor. I am joining you today from the territories of the Wasanich peoples and the Lekwungen speaking peoples. I, okay, I'll just do a brief introduction about myself. I uh, just graduated from high school in uh, June, <laughs> fun pandemic graduation, and I ran with the BC Greens in the last provincial election. Um, and now I work as the constituent advocate for MLA Adam Olson in North Saanich and the Islands, a member of the BC Green Caucus. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and what sort of like led you to want to run um, in the first place? So I um, have been very privileged to grow up in many different cultures and countries, and I was living in Tunisia during the Arab Spring, um, during the revolution, and that was, I was pretty young at the time, eight or nine, and that was kind of a, a big moment in my life when I saw the impact that, that people can have, um, that people can have on government and on kind of the history of that country. Um, and so that kind of was just sitting with me. And then I moved here um, and started getting involved in the environmental movement. Um, so it was a subject that was constantly discussed as I'm sure we all know in classes among my friends. And it kind of, it made me very uneasy to hear my friends joke like, oh, well, we're never gonna be able to have kids like, haha. And well, that's like funny and humor to cope, you know? It also is quite worrying and concerning. So um, I started, I was uh, co-head of my school's politics club and I became kind of involved that way. Um, and then one day I saw a petition from the BC Greens and I was like, oh my God, this is the party that I should be a part of. So uh, in 10th grade, I started as like a volunteer phone caller um, for the proportional representation referendum, which is something I also definitely can get behind. And uh, then I kind of fell out of it for a bit, wasn't really super involved. I did a bit of work in the 2019 federal election as a canvasser for my local candidate, the local green candidate. Um, and then this summer I got involved on Sonia Firstenau's campaign for leader of the BC Greens. And I started as a volunteer and then um, was hired on her campaign as her caller and get out the vote coordinator. Uh, which was very cool. <laughs> it was a very cool experience. Um, and then the campaign was over and she won. And then the election was called. And I was like, you know what? I'm holding off on university for a year. And what else am I going to do? <laughs> no. Um, no, but genuinely, I was like, this is an amazing opportunity to become involved in politics and to be a voice for young people, young women, especially. Um, and show that young people seriously deserve to have a place in politics and aren't just 
running uh, or being involved as a, as a joke. Kind of a long-winded answer, I apologize, but. No, that's great. I guess to that, um, I would then just ask you, like, what, what was your process like in, in getting started? Um, like you said, you, were, you decided to run, um, but what did that look like for you? And yeah. Yeah, so the process of starting to run, um, I would say started kind of in the 10th grade because that's when I kind of became involved in politics and and um, and I originally just reached out during the referendum. Political parties always need volunteers. And so I just reached out to ask to be a phone caller. Um, and that's when I realized, oh, this is this is accessible to me. Like that's really a tangible action that's very accessible. And while it's a bit scary to be calling people you don't know, D debating policy topics that also gave me a lot of confidence because it's a relatively low risk moment you know um and so you, you're trained up and everything so that i would say is actually when it started and then i became more politically active kind of just following the news educating myself on the issues just through reading talking with friends and then um and then this summer when i reached out to be a volunteer again on sonia's campaign i realized wow like my my actions are making they're i'm doing something in the world like my actions are actually having tangible effects and so then when the election was called i i was talking with my mom and i was like i think i should run and it was kind of like a crazy idea because i was like oh my god i was 17 and <laughs> i was like is that even legal so i looked it up and then i realized you only had to be 18 before general voting day which was the 24th and so i was like so it's le it's legal <laughs> um and which was definitely the first the first key step um but then I had a lot of people around me who really believed in me like I didn't that I think is very important especially when young women and people of marginalized genders become involved in politics is that the support system they have around them becomes incredibly important and powerful and because everyone around me and my support system said go for it I was immediately emboldened to go for it and I I was like, okay, and the first step is getting 125 signatures from constituents. And that, let me tell you, is a quick way to learn the lesson of rejection. <laughs> and especially during a pandemic, like approaching people, asking them, hi, can you sign my papers? Um, and that was also a really important step for me because I had come to a place where I had enough confidence in myself that I, I knew what I was doing. And so facing rejection like that, like with just a stranger right in front of me saying, no, I don't believe in you. I don't believe in what you stand for was a really important experience to go through to have to have people do that and then be able to be okay in myself and still feel strong in my in my opinions and beliefs um so yeah it took me five days to get those signatures and i would say like six hours a day getting those <laughs> but in the end it worked out um and like how do you sort of like take that rejection and like you said sort of like be okay with like how did you build that sort of ability because i feel like for a lot of people even just that thought of rejection is scary enough to say nope we're just not gonna do that <laughs> yeah well yeah definitely the first few i was like okay take some deep breaths kate you can do it um i would say so one thing that definitely benefited me was um becoming involved in my school's politics club because that's, that was, for me, it felt like a very low risk, safe place to voice my opinions, but then also to have debate with people. To, so I think an important part of learning how to deal with rejection or just being confronted with people who don't believe the same thing as you is to just begin that conversation with friends or just with people in like a casual environment. Like I have healthy debates and conversations with my family members all the time. And I think a lot of people, especially of our generation, it seems like to shy away from that conflict. Um, or, you know, I mean, I guess with like the algorithms on social media, we're constantly just inundated with people who think the same way we think. And I actively worked to break out of that and to be confronted with people whom I didn't see eye to eye with, <laughs> to have a healthy debate with the very conservative boy in my politics class. like. To, to have those debates in, in these low risk environments, um, at least, you know, what feels like low risk in that moment. And then um, learn that that's okay. Like you can go away and be okay with having a, having a, a debate with someone who doesn't 
agree with you and that it, it also actually strengthens your own opinions because you see different sides of the story and then you're ready to further defend what you believe in. Um, and you can't really form opinions if you don't see both sides of the story. So I would say like just not shying away from conflict by even in just my high school classes and with my parents and my family members, my conservative uncles. <laughs> um, and yeah, and that's really kind of what prepared me for just then being out on the street with constituents trying to, you know, get them to vote for me. <laughs> A little bit of an escalation. <laughs> And then I guess to add on to that one, is there anything else that you would tell to younger folk um, thinking about running um, and, you know, to, I guess, upon, like, pushing those boundaries, but, like, anything, anything past that? I would also, I would say, so go to people that you are inspired by and believe in. And so... One person who was super inspiring to me was, well, still is Sonia Firstenau, who's now the leader of the BC Greens. And so I, I was following her story and I realized she was in an election and I'm like this, she's inspiring to me. And so I, I just reached out. And often when you approach someone saying you're inspiring to me, they want to, you know, like they want to help you and they want, and especially someone like that will want to lift other young women up as well. Um, and so um, I would say definitely go to those who inspire you. And I know it's kind of a scary first step to take, but actively seek out those who inspire you, try to learn from them. I would also say a really important way to get started is just to inform yourself on the issues. And I know that that can feel scary. Like if you mess up, say something, but often if you just approach it with an aspect of a perspective, like I'm learning here, then no one can really fault you for trying to learn more and educate yourself. So I, I would say reading a lot is important and not just reading texts that you believe in, but that's just a good, a good way to start, honestly, just to, because then you become more confident and you actually are able to form opinions and beliefs. And yeah, that's, that's, those are two other ways I'd say to start. And do you think like, coming in sort of a bit younger um, sort of changed your experience of that? Cause like, not to say that like you can't teach an old dog new tricks, like not to throw that out there. <laughs> um, but do you think like sort of being younger changed your experience in general? I would say definitely, definitely being younger. I would say there were def there were positives and benefits of of entering the world of politics as a young person, as a young woman, especially. Um, I I did find that I many people said that my campaign was quite bold and quite audacious. That was a word that was used to describe me frequently. And in uh, and in one article, they called me a green pit bull. And in the moment, I was like. I don't think that that's really a compliment, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> um, so I think approaching like being young and, and not being bogged down by years of just negative political stuck in circles, like this is how the system is, this is how it's always gonna be. Like I was 17 at the beginning of the election, like I hadn't been involved in those systems. And it's like this, this hopeful belief that things can change. And, and I think approaching that as a young person is important and that's why we need more young people in politics. Um, but that definitely helped. And in my debates, um, I was debating Lana Pop, Minister Popham, who's the Minister of Agriculture. And people were like, weren't you nervous? And I was like, no, you know what? Like, I, I got this. And I think being young is definitely part of that. Um, but also being, being young and being a young woman means that it's deeply, deeply underestimated during the election and still now in my current position. And so that's difficult, but I think it also, you can surprise people when you're underestimated, they don't really expect you coming. But um, one thing that I just did, which was simple, but it's just like on my social media accounts, I don't read comments. Like I had my campaign manager help deal with that. And it's just those things that you don't need to engage with those people um, who are, quite cynical about young people being involved in politics and um and luckily I had a, I had a lot of support as well so just learning to brush off the people who are like you're too young it's like okay moving on <laughs> yeah yeah I feel like it's probably been like the biggest learning curve ever 
um, especially from coming from a position of like not being, not really being in politics to being the person on the face of the campaign. Um, and then <laughs> <laughs> to that extent, what, what do you think would be, if you could choose one, your biggest, your biggest learning opportunity or like learning expansion that you've personally gone through throughout all of this? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'd say one, so one thing that I learned um, that which started before when I, in the summer when I was volunteering on Sonia's campaign was, was being bold and just going for what you want. And I know that that's especially hard for women and people of marginalized genders because we're already in a more difficult position and not so often taught the same as, as men to be you know, bold and go for it. And so um, one thing that I appreciate about the Green Party is that the, they don't underestimate young people. And so immediately I felt like, wow, my voice is heard. And I just emailed her at literally one in the morning. Like I, and, <laughs> and then I was allowed to, I was, they invited me to volunteer on the team. And then because I'd put in the work and I started working like long, long days, not just as a volunteer, that then that was kind of like, I, I was actively putting in the effort and then I was hired. And so that was a, definitely a fortunate series of events, uh, which led me to that moment. But I, I learned that you have to be bold. And in these, like, in these ridiculously difficult times, in these terrifying times, when we look to the future and it's like, are we going to have a future? Like, this is a time that requires bold action. And so reminding myself, like, before I went into um, candidate debates or before I, I would do a big event, I just say to myself, like, be bold. And that was kind of just a mantra that I kept in my head. And, um, and it really, it, it really worked out. I think especially seeing a young, confident person was important for a lot of other young people um, to see politics as more accessible than just for older people who weren't speaking the same as them, who didn't really care, seem to care about the same issues. So yeah, it's, it's simple, but be bold. <laughs> you can use synonyms, be audacious. That's also a good one. <laughs> it's been a long since I've, since I've heard the word audacious. And it's great. <laughs> My campaign manager would say to me, like, before I do something, she'd be like, this is audacious. I'd be like, yeah, we're good to go. It's perfect. Then I've accomplished my goal. <laughs> um, and so you mentioned earlier sort of uh, your passion for, for climate change and how you got involved in that as well. Um, and so building on all of the sort of that you're young and that you're passionate about climate and um, how do you sort of like bring that intersectional lens sort of to your work and like to your your politics and your campaign? Yeah, this is definitely a really, really important piece. And, um, and for me, it started, it started, like I said before, before that was just being aware of my own privilege and knowing when I, when I would approach a situation of being aware of the privileged position in which I sit automatically in this world by being white. And I think that that, that, that was a very, very important piece. Um, and my second piece is not being afraid to learn. So not being afraid to say, I don't know, <laughs> I need you to explain this to me. You know better than I do. How could I ever understand? Please, please help me not understand because I never truly will, but just help me approach this and, and reckon, you know, with my own privilege. And so during my campaign, uh, it largely focused on police reform, um, on pushing for indigenous self-determination. And, um, and that's, that's what my kind of my campaign hugely focused on and, and focusing on how we approach environment, but we can approach environment with the an, an indigenous lens and learn from indigenous folks who've been <laughs> protecting the environment for a long, long time. Um, and so that that was really important to me in the campaign, and also learning from uh, especially indigenous young activists like Autumn Peltier, like just learning and and um, and so then thinking about that before I approach every single situation before I approached every single debate before I would go out and door knock to constituents and in my work now um, as the constituent advocate for Adam just thinking every day about that and how how I live in this world easier just because of the color of my skin and I think having that always front of mind when when approaching situations is 
is, um, is super important. I think it, it definitely um, backpacks off of that one, but um, you definitely have, have these values in like the climate crisis. And um, so I guess it's really easy in, in these days and especially with social media, especially with everything going on um, that we lose focus and we lose um, like our, our positionality and in, in what we value as important. So how did you kind of like you just briefly touched on that, but how how did you reposition yourself if you ever if you ever felt like you were slipping or if you ever felt like you were kind of losing losing that hope or what what inspired you to to do this in the first place? Yeah, that's definitely a very important question. I think one that a lot of people, especially a lot of young people, have to reckon with, um, especially during this time that is really affecting young people um and yeah there were some really long days in the campaign where I'd be I'd be door knocking and I'd just have like a, a bit of a tough moment and uh for me I'm very people driven and people focused and I'm yeah a lot of people would say like a quite extreme extrovert and so um and so I really rely on the people I have around me and so I built I made sure that that was an important part for me was building a strong team around me and not just a campaign team. Like I had amazing volunteers. I had an amazing campaign manager, but having in, like my, my friends close to me and important to me um, be there for me in those moments when I just felt like this is so overwhelming. Um, and then more broadly, just when you think about the environment and the world and it seems scary, um, connecting with other young people who feel the same way can feel like it might feel like not what you think to do is isn't talk with someone about how you're both scared but for me I think that is really helpful to know that you know you're not alone in this fear and that also there are tons and tons of amazing young activists and older activists too working to make it better and so connecting with those networks so um I was super honored to receive one of the um to be named one of the top environmentalists in canada um 25 under 25 through the starfish and that has been an incredibly valuable network for me because those are people who you know have the same values as i do and care about the same things and are all working on their own separate projects all over canada and so just hearing these stories brings me hope and like I, it sounds cheesy but it really does to just connect with those people who are also working so hard um and that yeah that's so that's kind of what i did i'd made sure to think back and draw on those people and then also call up my best friend to ask her to bring me some ice cream <laughs> dairy free though so <laughs> yeah and sort of because so touching on what you sort of went like in your campaign you had uh police reform and then tackling climate crisis um slight subject yeah you know just like just little itty bitty problems it's good. yeah <laughs> um so how do you not get overwhelmed by how not itty bitty those problems are <laughs> i so sorry i just have to go turn off the space heater in my room it's just like so warm in here okay one second i'll be right back okay sorry i'm back um it's just really too warm in here um yeah so dealing with like those big topics is quite intense and to be honest like I really struggled during the election with that because um especially during a campaign that's your job to talk about how everything's going wrong and how your party and you will fix it for the better um and so it's it's a lot of focus on a lot of really difficult negative things um but for me it was really and it still is like I still kind of reckon with those issues on a daily basis and um and and for me it's about perspective and just thinking about the fact that I I'm doing something in like and I know personally I know my limits I know I'm not going to solve by myself the climate crisis <laughs> um but that it's important to have perspective like I'm doing something and and kind of when I feel overwhelmed at work now or when I feel overwhelmed during the election I just think well I'm doing what I can and that's all I can do. And so it, it, it is like also just so simple. Like I'm like, I'm doing what I can. 
and that's that's all I can do. And then um, going outside to get some fresh air, go stand in the water in the ocean and just be like, you know what, I'm doing what I can do. And for me, really like connecting with nature is also like a huge way to just reset and like to be so fortunate to live in such a beautiful place. Like I just go on a walk, literally like a 10 minute walk, <laughs> go on like a hike, go swim in the ocean, just something that's like gr to ground me and then remind myself that I'm doing what I can and I am a small person in a big world and we do what we can. I think that's a super important part of, of any work that we do is grounding ourselves in it. Um, and I guess to go along with that is like how it important it is to have to have those connections and ground yourself in your work through through the connections that you have. Um, so what would you say to someone who may feel like they don't necessarily have the means or the connections um, to to get started in politics if, if they're thinking about that? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um... I just want to speak to one more thing. Sorry about the last question that I will answer the second question, but I also want to say that like, I think it's important that you have, for me, friendship is a really important value. And so having friend friendship within my work and within the elections also really important for me and just a base level of respect. So like respect and friendship. So there's still like a human connection. And so even when you're talking about these big, scary subjects, it's like, no, we're still all human and we're connected. And and that was that was definitely important for me. And I was, I'm grateful that it was such a respectful campaign um, between the candidates. Um, secondly, okay, second question. Um, I, yeah, I would say, so just to echo what I said before is, is kind of, is reaching out to people who inspire you and they don't have to be like, you know, inaccessible people who don't live where you are. Just reaching out to people who inspire you every day and also, um, reaching out to political parties during elections, especially always need volunteers, like literally always need volunteers. Like you can Google their platforms and then go with what you agree with or like, and you're not bound to them forever, but they always need volunteers. And starting as a phone caller for me was huge because it really broke down that barrier and that those barriers are put up more for women and people in lower socioeconomic classes and people of marginalized genders. And so just breaking that barrier of getting involved as a phone caller in a campaign was like a huge first step because you just gain so much confidence from that experience. So I would definitely say that. I would also say getting involved with local NGOs or um, organizations. So for example, one thing I believe in is youth participation in politics, clearly. And so I would, recommend getting involved with vote 16 bc and they run like super accessible social media campaigns that you can be involved in and so um i'd say social media is is important as well to find out who you can connect with um but looking at local organizations like vote 16 bc is is a great example and they're doing a lot of good work and they're run by young people so that feels accessible as well when you see someone who's running an organization that you think you'd like to be a part of and so this is a, less, a little less abstract of a question, but um, so switching from being a volunteer to being a candidate, what is that process? Um, like the physical like steps to be like, this is something I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can only speak to that within the BC Greens. Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, if it's the exact same process for the BC NDP or the BC Liberals. Um, but uh so for me, volunteering on the campaigns enabled me to kind of have, create some connections within the Green Party and um, just, you know, be connected to people. And so when the election was called, um, I thought, okay, I want to run. And how do I go about that? And they actually put out a call for candidates. So the Greens put out like a general call for candidates. There are a few general things you have to be, which is... Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, which is one of them as uh, over the age of 18. So didn't really cross that one off, but, <laughs> no, but there's just general, um, general rules and that's what they, they post. And so then you get involved with your local riding association who are a group of people who uh, 
you know, help decide the candidate and support the candidate within that riding. And so the BC Greens have a riding association um, in a bunch of different areas, not every area, but the NDP and Liberals also have riding associations. Um, and that, I forgot to mention this, but the riding associations are also good places to get involved in between elections, because those are very accessible places to get involved. And um, it's usually just a group of volunteers who then vote on the candidate. And so they kind of, I know in the Green Party, they do like book clubs and they have events in between, um, which is, that's a great way to get involved as well. Um, but anyway, so I reached out to the riding association and I said, I'd like to run in Sandwich South. Um, and then, there was another candidate. And so we went for interviews and you, I just presented my, what I, what my plan was. Um, and I came prepared with my campaign manager and I came with my 125 signatures, which was huge. And that was actually like a huge barrier, um, to, to running. It, it was like, it was much more difficult than I'd anticipated to get the signatures. And it's scary. Like it was like, that was a lot. So, but then physically getting them and I went and I did my interview and then they recommend you to the party. And so once that whole system goes through and you go through your riding association, um, it goes to the party for senior leadership to approve. And so it, yeah, it went to senior leadership. Um, they approved it. And then they background check you and vet you. And actually some candidates don't make it past that stage. <laughs> um, and so they, yeah, they vet your social media um, and everything like that. And then you are officially the candidate. And so, yeah, so in some ways it's like a simple process, but there, there are like, and there are clear steps to follow, but um, there are also moments that, you know, where you might not make it through. And so definitely um, certain things like being prepared with my signatures helped me get recommended by the riding association. Um, also just a bit of luck, <laughs> like it was a snap election. Um, and one huge barrier in politics is that um, in snap elections, women and people of color more often can't just drop everything for one month and just run in an election and, you know, like, that's much more difficult for them to do. And I was, I was lucky that I was on a gap year um, and that I had those opportunities. And so it's kind of just like a series of fortunate events and also being involved um, in the right moment, but definitely getting involved with your local riding association, I would say is a huge and important part if you ever want to be a candidate. Um, Cause you also get to vote on the candidate. So like, why not, you know? And then federally you can get involved with your EDA, which is just, for the bigger area, yeah. Um, I think to, to go on top of that one, um, it seems like just quite a process and quite a process that you had to navigate yourself. Um, obviously you had the connections, but um, definitely for a 17 year old, like that's a lot to take on. Um, and with social media, like we can, we can always feel like overwhelmed and stuff, but at what point did you kind of have the realization, like, I'm actually doing this, like, that's crazy? Yeah, so um, I definitely, I, I put out on my Twitter, I had, what well, I had like eight followers, <laughs> and I put out on my Twitter, like, um, I am seeking the nomination in Sandwich South. So that doesn't mean that you're okay as the candidate, that just means that you're seeking the candidate nomination um and it didn't like it did not go viral by any means but it got like 300 re retweets and i was like for eight followers that's pretty good <laughs> um and it was kind of like it was very overwhelming because i wasn't officially the candidate people had misunderstood that because it's it's confusing language saying i'm seeking the nomination and so people were like congratulations i was like oh my god now i really hope that i get it um but that was kind of a big moment because that was also the first time that I had negative comments because up until then, everyone around me, my family, my friends had all organized and they were like, yeah, go for it. And that was the first time when I was like, whoa, okay. So some people are not going to be on board with this. Um, and so that's, that was a moment where I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, and then after I'd been through that whole process, like a week later, um, we were standing at a press conference um in oak bay 
and I was standing with Sonia in front of me and then the three other candidates beside me and all the cameras. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And that's when I fully was like, what is happening? And I was staying there and I heard Sonia was making the announcements and she's like, you know, Nicole Duncan, Oak Bay Gordon Head, we're so pleased to have her running with us. And then Kate O'Connor and Sandwich South. And I was like, wow. Yay. But also like, that was a huge, that was a huge moment. Um, and then the, and also the first interview I did was also a big moment, like, um, an interview with, I think CTV Vancouver and just having like an actual camera. I was like, okay, wow, this is also another big moment. Um, yeah, I would have loved in, to have a little more media training. I think that was also something that was a bit overwhelming, but I mean, it was just it, with a snap election happened so fast, but um, that is also, I think that was one of the more scary aspects, um, was the media and, um, learning not to get tripped up in questions. Like if a question's posed to you, like, so you were the, um, head of your high school politics club and you think that's enough experience to represent a riding with 50,000 people in it. And like when a question's asked that way, uh, it's important to not panic because you can't be like, well, yes. And you can't be like, no, nah, I don't know. So like, I mean, and there is a proper way to answer that question, which is like attacking the premise of the question. Like, so you think young people shouldn't be able to participate in politics. Like I might not have the amount of life experience. I have a different life experience. No one in the legislature today knows what it's like to grow up young, knows what it's like to grow up in a climate crisis. And these are all valid points to make, but when you've just been asked that question, there's like a moment of panic. So uh, also those were also some moments where I was like, wow. <laughs> but luckily, um, I think I'm a pretty quick study. So I, I got that under control pretty fast. <laughs> and do you think like that's just practice or is there like something that you would have like liked to know before that happened is it like I just, is it yeah, just so it's natural it's, born talent <laughs> no no no. it's definitely this is this is interesting because like you don't you don't necessarily when you see politi politicians think oh wow they're doing such a good job in these in these media briefs whatever you're like you, do, you just don't really think about that but so what I did to practice was I would like listen to media moments like Sonia at that time was speaking all the time in press conferences and I was like so if I was asked that question how would I respond and um also it forces you to really narrow down your platform and narrow down what you stand for and understand what you're saying with yourself and making sure you say it clearly but to practice I literally had my dad over dinner and over walks quiz me asking me the meanest harshest questions he could think of and it's just practice. And like the first times I was like, oh my God, it's a disaster, like in tears over my chicken or whatever. But like that, that kind of thing is like really important to have someone you trust, just be able to ask you these questions. And like, I think almost all the candidates I knew had that. They either had their campaign manager or someone close to them, just quiz them on the questions. And that's definitely something that can be learned. And um, I was really lucky during the election that I had a lot of media coverage for my age that I also then, because I had so much media coverage was constantly doing interviews and that, that became really easy for me. Um, and it becomes easy for a lot of candidates. So I think the first one is a bit scary, but, um, practice, it's definitely a learned skill, not one that I went into having. <laughs> also important, one other thing to research who is interviewing you. And I only learned that after I was interviewed by a, a kind of more right-wing media station. And then I was like, okay, so this is why we research who is interviewing you beforehand so that you know the tone of the interview. Um, you know, if it's like a specific journalist, just kind of see what they've written before. And that's, it's, it's just so you can know what's happening. The more information you have, the more prepared you are, the easier it is. And I guess for that one, um, I was just thinking about like, for people who are definitely more marginalized than, than even us, um, is there, is there other kind of organizations, people, people in place, um, that, that can help support them if they, they are like pressed for time or stuff like that, because it's often the people that are most marginalized that are the least represented in, in 
in politics. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely was a huge barrier um, for the BC Greens as well. During this last election, it was like incredibly difficult for everyone to get candidates who were you know like who were women or people of color because it, it's just like it is so much harder for them to just drop everything um and at least in like the i can only speak to my experience with the bc green party like everyone's pretty cognizant of that um and so offering support where necessary and where needed but there are definitely i'm sorry i can't name them off the top of my head but there are definitely um separate ngos and organizations who offer that kind of support who offer media training um, if there was more time, there would have been media training offered by the party that you're in and, and tailored to your specific needs and, and who you are as a person. I think it's important that we recognize that we are different and have different needs and different life experiences. Um, and yeah, so there definitely are those supports out there, um, which are important to research as well. Um, and I think that's kind of often the scary first step is researching <laughs> and, um, and reaching out. But like for me, for example, um, because I was, I guess I still am quite young, um, I had Vote 16 BC support me. And so that was not, not they're not connected to, um, they're not connected to the Green Party in any way. They just supported me um, because that's what, that's what they believe in. And so I'm sure there are other organizations like that who support people of color, for example. And so for someone who maybe doesn't want to run, um, but still has views and issues that they want to sort of speak on, um, I know media is sort of a big place for that right now. Do you have any advice for like how to effectively use social media platforms to sort of as your own like campaign platform? But um, and I feel like it's good for like our generation because... Yeah, definitely super important. And and one thing that I had to be reminded of by my campaign manager actually was that I kind of had the expectation that like, this is what a politician is. And like, they're very serious and they use big words and they don't say like, and I'm all the time and they don't do funny things. Like they don't watch TikToks, like all these things. Like, and so my campaign manager was like, no, 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 no. Like you do what makes you, you and you're young and speak like yourself. Like you can be young and articulate, like speak like who you are. And I think that that's a trap that a lot of young people fall into um, is that they get in these positions and I definitely fell into it first and then tried to act like an adult or like act like someone that I wasn't. And so coming across as my true self on my social media was very important. Got to tone it down for Facebook because that's a bit of an older crowd, but <laughs> like on Twitter and Instagram, for example, just saying things like they were like not trying to write these long, long winded, like full sentence things like thinking it was funny, like using emojis being like, this is ridiculous. Like just like saying what I thought, I think coming across as really genuine is important for a lot of young people. And then to have, have other young people connect with you. Um, one of my friends and another woman who has run for the Greens, Mackenzie, has a, quite a funny TikTok. And I know a lot of like older people are like, what is that? But like she, you know, like she's just being herself. And that's, I think, really important to be genuine on these platforms. Um, and yeah, I would also say just like a general tip that I had with my social media was just to keep everything brief, <laughs> like getting into like long paragraphs and like maybe like a long Twitter thread once in a while. But like, yeah, I, I think sometimes people just try to overdo it and act like someone they're not rather than just being genuine. A lot of young people have a lot of really good ideas. And so just being genuine with it um, is definitely important. And then in like more, more formal media, like radio interviews or TV, um, learning how to stay on message and um, practicing that because clearly the media is great, but they also want a specific thing. Like they want a fun story. They want something that's different um, and being okay with being like, this is the question. And then I am going to answer the question, but I'm also going to say what I want to say. And for me, especially there was a lot of focus on my age. And so I would just get through that and be like, yes, I'm young exciting and here's actually what I think about oil and gas subsidies <laughs> and being okay with that um, and learning that it can feel a bit uncomfortable but then 
um, reminding yourself that, you know, you're just, you're just trying to get your point across and this, is what you believe in this, is what's important. And it's not really important when my birthday is, uh, it's important that we don't kill the environment. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's really important to remember just being genuine because like as young people going into politics, I feel like our whole, our whole thing is to change things. And so what use is that if we're, if we're just going to repeat the patterns of, of our, the, the people who were before us. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess on like a lighter note, um, there's been a rise of social justice issues in the past like two years um, from what Soden to Mi'kmaq to BLM to you know, all the climate strikes. And I think it's definitely been brought up by a lot of young people. And like, it's really showing that young people really do care. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess to that extent, do you, do you think we're gonna see in the next few years as, as the climate strikers get into age of, of being the ones in, in, in office? Like, are, are we gonna see a rise in young, young politicians? I think definitely. I also want to say that um, tomorrow is the one year anniversary of the Witsuden protest, uh, which is important to recognize. Um, but I definitely think that there's going to be a rise in young politicians. There were quite a few young politicians across parties in this election, which was very exciting um, for me to see. And um, I think young people are realizing that it is going to be us who deal with this and I it just angers me every day that the youngest member of the legislature who's making decisions about the future of our province is 35 and she's great like she's great but it's like we need younger people there and to not have one voice is quite alarming and I think that as we see the gravity of the situation we find ourselves in in this pandemic, as we, you know, literally are choking on smoke from forest fires, young people are becoming more aware. And even those who aren't necessarily traditionally politically active understand that it's a problem. Um, and so I do think definitely we will see a rise in young politicians. And that is part of the reason why I ran. I didn't only run with the intention of winning. I ran as well to show young people that it is accessible, it's important. And that if I can do it, then they can do it too. And that that's important for people to see themselves represented, especially as well, people of color. Um, and so just like, I think there's going to be a huge wave of young people who do get involved in politics and that this is only the beginning, which is also something that keeps me very, very hopeful. Um, and one thing that I spoke about in the election, one, one thing that I'm trying to work with and grapple with is all the all the movement and momentum and energy around the climate movement like the climate strikes how do we transfer that into political participation and into literally just voting um i have a lot of my friends who were out climate striking and then wouldn't vote in this provincial election and i think when when we realize as well that it's important to fight the system but it's also within the system change is also made there's two ways to make change um and by voting in and electing leaders who we believe in, who look like us, who are young, who represent us, um, that's also an important way to make change because they are the ones who are gonna change the legislation, um, which is also super, super important. Yeah, I feel like that was a huge thing for me. Cause like I said, like I'm in bio, I'm not in poli sci. Um, and so, but my, my partners in poli sci, I always saw our degrees as very, very separate. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I am being so wildly naive <laughs> because obviously I was like learning about the climate strike and I was learning about the science behind climate change and all the different pieces. And then kind of just being like, all right, mm -hmm. now I have that information. So there's that. Um, and then I was like, you can't really have one without the other. And I feel like that was a really big piece mm -hmm. for me learning. <laughs> um, Oh, sure. And so now here I am in a politically oriented club <laughs> and absolutely loving it. Um, but uh, sort of just being cognizant of the time, um, I'll ask sort of like one last question. Then if Maya has any more, I'll let her sort of finish it off. Um, but what are sort of the next steps for you? Um, I know right now, obviously, you're 
you're in your position. And, but <laughs> after that, <laughs> um, what does it sort of look like for you? Yeah, so like a lot of people my age, I uh, took the year off school um, because of the COVID situation. And I was like, you know what, what can I do in this year? So um, working with the Greens has been great. And I do definitely love the role that I'm in now. Um, and I definitely will continue to stay connected with the Greens um, and be involved that way. I have applied to universities, <laughs> so hopefully get in somewhere. Uh, and then I will be off in the fall to university, um, to study. I'm not sure if I'm going to study poli sci necessarily, um, but definitely remain in that world, remain active, um, continue working with the Greens, volunteering with them. Um, and that's kind of where I see myself going with this, staying involved within the environmental movement, um, you know, just have a lot of friends now in that world. And so um, in small ways, continuing to just like have conversations with them and support them in their projects and what they're doing in, in the world. And um, yeah, and then my, my real passion is getting young people involved in politics. And for me, that's how I see my, my role and how I can help progress social justice movements, progress the climate movement um, by getting young people involved in politics. And so just working in my own life to encourage other young people around me to become involved in politics. I had a lot of really, really cool young people volunteer on the campaign, um, stay connected to these people, support them in the projects that they're doing. Um, and I think that facilitating that is is definitely important and i hope to also help the bc greens kind of develop like a youth engagement strategy um i think that that's one thing that we as a party specifically can can develop and engage upon so that is what i will be looking at doing over the coming um months and then and then off to university <laughs> to do some studying <laughs> and then and then i'll be back <laughs> in the political world yeah, no, I I don't think I had any other questions, but if if you Kate would like to end it off and like any any last advice or anything you you want to say, feel free. Okay, well, I want to say first of all, thank you for having me. This has been great. Um and yeah, my my advice to other people who want to be involved is that I I understand that it's it's scary and I understand that there are big societal factors that just kind of seem overwhelming at times um, and a huge barrier for people to get involved in politics. Um, and I'd say just on a personal note, like I'm always here for anyone who is watching this or who wants to be involved, like please reach out. Um, I think a lot of people are scared to reach out. So reaching out to me, reaching out to your elected officials um, is important and asking for resources and how you can be involved is definitely a key first step. Um, and just for young people, like, don't, don't be discouraged. I know that it seems overwhelming and scary, but there's, I mean, so many people out there fighting the same fight. Um, and I, I personally feel very hopeful about the future and about, um, about the fact that more young people are going to be involved in politics. So those are my final thoughts. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much. That was super fun. And I feel like super useful for people who will be listening in the future. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, if we get any emails from watchers, I will forward them to you. <laughs> or they can obviously contact yeah. you. Anyone is free to reach me. I'm just going to put my email in here because I have my... Um, DC green email that is checked like not that regularly <laughs> so I need to put my other one in that's my that's my personal email that you can share uh with anyone who wants to get involved um, okay great 